Now that's interesting. This podcast is about the Georgia Tech Sam Nunn School of International Affairs. It's graduates, their careers, and how the Nunn School has helped to shape their futures. Take a listen. Welcome back to Now That's Interesting. I'm Stephanie Jackson. And I'm Sydney Pawanka. And we are getting back into our series on minors on this podcast. And today, we're talking with a graduate of Georgia Tech, Sona Chandra, who received a Bachelor's of Science in Biomedical Engineering, along with a minor in International Affairs from the Nunn School. While at Georgia Tech, Sona completed a co-op in design quality engineering with St. Jude Medical, conducted research at Emory University, was a part of the pre-med track, was a Georgia Tech student ambassador, volunteered with GT Trust, a mentorship and tutoring program, was a part of the Society of Women in Engineering, and studied abroad with the European Union Study Abroad Program, as well as a study abroad program with the University of Limerick in Ireland. So you can say she was an active and engaged student while she was at Tech. And following graduation, Sona landed a role with Takeda in Denmark as a digital engineer and was then promoted to integrated solution engineer. In 2017, she co-founded Oshi Health, which is a digital medicine platform for patients with gastrointestinal diseases. She has served as the product manager, the head of clinical strategy and operations, and currently serving on OSHI Health's clinical advisory board. Sona recently joined Morantix as an entrepreneur in residence focused on building the next health tech venture and received the accolade of Forbes 30 Under 30 for Science and Healthcare. Congratulations, Sona. That's quite an achievement. Thank you guys so much for a very dynamic introduction. Yeah, being named one of the top young entrepreneurs in Europe. That uh, Forbes under 30 list, it seems to highlight the young visionary leaders that are reinventing business and society. And you were selected for the science and healthcare industries, correct? Yep, that's correct. That's correct. So how has that recognition impacted your work with OSHI Health or your career aspirations in general? Um, so the you know being recognized uh, by Forbes was was a, was a true honor. I think more than anything, um, it's afforded me a platform to really sort of find ways to lift and develop others. So through through that recognition, I've had a lot of different people sort of reach out to me um, from various backgrounds, both um, people who are potential mentors as well as potential mentees. Um, and so I, I really found it a good kind of platform for me to sort of reach out and, and help aspiring engineers, aspiring people looking to get into the digital health field, um, sort of reach out and, and, and advise them on, on how to sort of build their career. So I think that's been one key key area. Um, mm-hmm. I, think, I think in general, sort of having, having that recognition has, has given me the opportunity to network with a really amazing group of leaders um, through the Forbes 30 Under 30 community, um, which has already kind of benefited um, me on my entrepreneurial ventures as well. That's awesome. So you are a co-founder of Oshi Health and have also worked as the product manager, the head of clinical strategy and operations, and are now on the clinical advisory board there. Um, so what exactly is Oshi Health? Um, thank, great, great question. So Oshi sort of initially started as a digital disease management platform for patients with inflammatory bowel diseases, so ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Um, And the core premise of the product was that we found that by combining data from a patient-facing application um, that, you know, basically enabled patients to track their their symptoms and their general health outcomes, and pairing that with data from an at-home stool test that measured a specific inflammatory marker in the patient's stool, um, that we were able to sort of monitor patient disease activity over time and enable a personalized and tailored intervention um, to prevent the worsening of their outcomes. Um, this model in, in clinical studies, we were able to show that it reduced 
their duration from an average of 77 days to 18 days. Um, so some pretty amazing results. And as we were going to market with this platform, we got a lot of interest from the broader gastrointestinal disease kind of community. Um, at the same time, we caught wind of a lot of trends happening um, across globally, but especially in the U.S., um, around enabling things like value-based healthcare um, and virtual care. And so we decided to sort of evolve the platform to become a virtual gastrointestinal specialized integrated practice unit. Um, so if you look at patients with these diseases, you, you sort of start to realize that many of them sort of suffer from a severe lack of optimization in the current standard of care. Um, so patients with irritable bowel syndrome, for example, um, often find themselves going to the doctor presenting their symptoms, and their doctor's like, mm, you're fine, you just have tummy problems, you know, take take a couple times, like go home kind of thing. Um, and these people are truly, truly suffering and they're sort of on their own to kind of figure out a solution. Um, at the same time, in, in very large specialized academic medical centers, there's a lot of proof that shows that by combining um, dietary approaches with psychological approaches, in addition to sort of the pharmacological traditional kind of med clinical approaches, who could really sort of improve outcomes and get these people to a place of remission. And so we wanted to make that really high level of care that's usually only found in large urban centers like, you know, New York City, LA, et cetera, um, and make that sort of accessible to a, a broader population. And so we created a virtual integrated practice unit where we actually have gastroenterologists, dietitians, psychologists, and health coaches um, sort of all working together, delivering really high quality care to patients with, with GI conditions. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so I think you kind of touched on this a little bit in your answer, but why exactly did you decide to start Oshi Health? Yeah, no, I mean, so digestive health is something that um, I, I feel that this is a patient population that's really largely underserved in the current sort of standard of care. Um, my mom, for example, she's, she suffers from irritable bowel syndrome, and I sort of saw firsthand how difficult it was for her to really kind of find a solution for her problems. One of the biggest issues with this disease area is that it's a very heterogeneous disease area, which means that no two patients are alike. Um, but right now, most patients are sort of managed in kind of a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, and so I, I sort of started really realizing that there's a lot of problems in the space, a lot of areas that these patients are sort of suffering um, and a lot of room for improvement. And I, I really wanted to make a change there. Um, so that, that, that was what kind of inspired me to start OSHI. That's awesome. Um, and so where exactly do you see um, OSHI Health going in the next couple of years? In the next couple of years. So our primary sort of um, scaling model at this point, I think that you know, there were a lot of really bad things that came out from COVID. Um, but one, I think positive shift is that people are becoming more and more um, ready to work with clinicians through a telemedicine solution. Um, we've already started mm -hmm. seeing a lot of benefits from kind of that, that shift. Um, in the long term, we, we hope to be able to sort of enable any patient who has digestive health conditions, initially in the U.S., but eventually globally, um, to be able to access really high quality care through the platform. In the long term, we, we basically have... Um, created a provider practice that enables us to create to generate a large amount of, of data on how these patients actually um, how, how their disease actually progresses in reality. Um, so I had mentioned before that no two patients are alike. And these and, and the problem is, is that there's not enough data and information out there to make it um, sort of clear what exactly are the differences between patients and how can we sort of create subtypes and subcategories between patients to basically predict what treatments are going to be best suited for what patient type. And so we, as we scale, are collecting a lot of, a large amount of structured patient data that we can then use to basically enable the next wave of precision medicine. So eventually being able to combine genomics data, microbiomics data, all sorts of data that's found within your body, correlating that with various outcomes and being able to create predictive models that enable us to deliver very personalized precision um, uh, models of care. That's awesome. Um, that's definitely so important. And that's definitely really cool to see that growth um, in OSHI Health. Um, so how have you seen international affairs um, or internationalization more generally apply um, within OSHI Health? Yeah, so we actually initially got a lot of interest from 
key, key European markets. Um, and, and, you know, as a part of my role, I, I really have the benefit of getting to know how healthcare systems really differ from country to country um, and how, um, not only how they differ, but how those differences really can change the quality of care and the outcomes that people and patients are actually seeing on the other side of the equation. Um, moreover, the way that you can commercialize and actually kind of implement various digital health and technology solutions is very different from market to market. Um, so initially we had a lot of interest from um, very, some, some, some key European markets. Um, so Denmark is a great example. We had a, we, we partnered with the Danish healthcare system, um, which they, you know, as, as a kind of a national payer, they, they're sort of incentivized to actually bring in solutions like this, um, and deliver, deliver to their patients. Like if you look at it from a purely financial standpoint, they're the ones paying out for the patients. All of the providers are being paid out um, by them directly. And so everyone is, has similar kind of incentives to make sure people stay healthy um, and, and that this, the costs associated with caring for these patients is, is reduced. Um, so that was kind of one key element that I noticed from sort of working in some of these single payer system markets. When you mm -hmm. compare that with a country like the U.S., that's very fragmented, where there's multiple kinds of health insurers and payers, um, everything from sort of your government payers like Medicare, Medicaid, to um, the vast amount of commercial insurers, to even employer-sponsored health care. Um, the, the, the path to commercialization is very, is a little bit different. Um, so you find that a, a lot of the times, um, employers, uh, employer sponsored healthcare is, especially those who are self-insured employers can often be a really interesting place to kind of scale innovation because employers tend to have a lot of incentives to kind of adopt these kinds of solutions. Um, and, and lower their overall costs in, of care in general. Um, in, when, you, when you look at sort of trying to partner with commercial insurers, um, as well as trying to partner with, with providers, it becomes a little bit different because you have multiple stakeholders that are involved in the equation and the incentives are a little bit competing. So I'll give you an example. Most clinicians, like most physicians and doctors um, and nurses and people who are delivering the actual care, they're paid for on a fee-for-service basis, which means that they get paid a certain amount for a specific service or procedure, which means that economically, like on paper, I mean, in theory, you know, they, they're doing the right thing and they became a clinician because they want to help people. But financially, their, their incentives are a little bit perverse because they're sort of incentivized to get people in the door um, treat them with their highest cost procedure and get them out the door. Um, and they're, they're sort of incentivized to maximize the amount of volume, the high volume of the highest cost procedures as possible. Um, on, in contrast, most commercial payers are incentivized to sort of maximize patient health outcomes at the lowest cost possible. And so you sort of see that there are competing incentives between healthcare providers and healthcare payers. Um, and that's something that it fits itself in a little bit of a different variation from market to market. Hope that answered your question. It did. It did. I think I think the most important thing that we got out of that conversation, or hear what you just shared, is how much you've highlighted a very useful background on the mechanics of healthcare, um, you know, and how that might differ from country to country. And how, you know, the different, mm -hmm. you might have different approaches and different solutions. So that was certainly exactly. very, very informing. Very informative. I, um, Sydney asked you about international affairs. And so I want to ask you now to think a little bit back about when you were in your student days, when you decided to major in biomedical engineering and when you enrolled at Georgia Tech, you also decided to pursue a minor in international affairs. So what led you to do that? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, I've, I've always had a very sort of international mindset and I always sort of dreamed about being able to sort of make an impact on a global scale. Um, at the same time, I, you know, I had found out about um, the, the, the the minor as well as the um, European Union study abroad program that was sort of based in, in, in Belgium, but, you know, we had the opportunity to sort of travel around Europe um, and that that program could sort of nicely set me up for a minor. 
Um, and so mm -hmm. I was really interested in that program. I was super excited about the opportunity to, to, to sort of come to Europe, Europe for my first time, um, get to work mm -hmm. directly and meet directly with policymakers at various levels, everything from sort of the national level to the EU level, um, and, and sort of meet with various kinds of government bodies, NGOs, et cetera, think tanks. Um, I, I, I ultimately sort of was, su was super excited about that program and, and sort mm -hmm. of like adding on an, an into minor would sort of only serve to benefit my kind of diploma and my, my experience with Georgia Tech. Um, so that's sort of what inspired me. Okay. You also went on an exchange program with the University of Limerick, right? Yep, that's correct. That was, that was more focused in biomedical engineering. Um, yeah. But, but I did go to Ireland as well, yeah. So how are those two, pro two programs different for you in terms of how they influence your education or career choices? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think that the the INTA program um, in, in Belgium was totally different from any other classes that I had taken at Georgia Tech up until that time. Um, mm -hmm. I had primarily been focusing in sort of the, the STEM space. And so having sort of the opportunity to kind of expand my portfolio and my um, kind of perspective on the world with that, with those into classes, um, mm -hmm. really exciting and really valuable. And I think that I, I, I was able to sort of get an understanding of international affairs and um, how various international bodies interact with each other, various theories and sort of um, concepts in international affairs that end up that you end up starting to notice in, in everyday life once you once you learn those things you start seeing them in the news all the time you start, sort of uh -huh. use them as frameworks for how you understand how countries interact with each other and how marketplaces interact with each other I think that that sort of opened my mind and my perspectives in a in a totally new way in in, in contrast to the very sort of stem focused classes that I had been taking um, so when I was in was when I was in Ireland I was very much sort of continuing my BME education um, and so it was It was a little bit different in the sense that we had the opportunity to visit a lot of medical device companies that were based in Ireland and get a feel for how those companies operate in a different market and how the healthcare systems differ. Um, mm -hmm. But it was still very sort of engineering focused. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. And so now that we talked a little bit about... Um, those study abroad programs that you went on, um, we're going to shift a little bit to talk about your opportunities um, and experiences during your time at Georgia Tech. So you were a researcher at Emory University while at Georgia Tech. Um, so what was your research? Yes, yeah, so my research on? was focused on optimizing the transition from pediatric to adult care um, in patients in pediatric patients who had gone through some sort of um, hep uh, some sort of liver transplant surgery, um, so typically what happens is you know if you're if you're a pediatric patient and you're kind of in need of a liver transplant, you're probably extremely sick, and you've probably kind of you know been growing up with parents who are very worried about you, who are you know going to, going to the doctor all the time who are taking care of you, who are, um, you know, laying out all of your medication all throughout the day, really sort of planning your life to a T to make sure that your health is maintained. Um, and the problem, the problem that sort of arises is that when those pediatric patients then end up sort of turning 18 and moving on to adulthood, they no longer, they start not really having that sort of parental involvement and they did never really learned how to manage their condition by themselves. And so there tends to be, what you'll notice is that there really tends to be a drop off in things like, in really key things like medication adherence, you know, following up with appointments, taking care of yourself. It's especially important for patients with um, liver transplants that they really avoid drinking alcohol or taking drugs. Um, a lot of the times what you'll find is that these patients who have sort of been kind of babied their whole life for lack of a better term, um, once they sort of graduate into adult care, they they never really learned how to be responsible for their own medical care. Um, and so their health outcomes end up really kind of dropping off. And so we really wanted to sort of analyze this drop off and sort of determine what, what are some ways that we can mm -hmm. kind of make sure that that transition to adult care is kind of optimized so that we prevent these patients from, from having really sort of negative health outcomes associated with kind of not properly managing their condition during that transition. Yeah. And so um, since you were able to get involved in research um, during your time at Georgia Tech, um, 
how were you able to go about this? What resources are open um, to students who may be looking for um, research opportunities during their career? Yeah, that's a good question. I honestly think that um, researchers, professors, et cetera, they really respond well to students who truly demonstrate a passion for the subject that they're working on. Um, in my case, I, you know, I, I just sort of emailed a, a, a clinician and researcher at Emory, um, and I, I told her, I'm, you know, I'm really interested in healthcare. Um, at that time, I had initially been thinking I might want to go, want to go to med medical school, and so I really had wanted to get experience working in a clinic, working working within a hospital setting, um, you know, being being able to shadow her and sit in on on appointments to really get a, a lay of the land. And it was by demonstrating my passion for this field and for finding ways to really optimize the way that healthcare is delivered um, that ultimately kind of you know, made her interested in working with me. And so my advice to any student who's interested in research is go read some publications from some key, in, in some key areas that you're very interested in. Find something that you're passionate about or that really sort of resonates with you and just send an email to that professor and, you know, just kind of tell them that you want to speak with them about their, about their paper. Um, and that you would love an opportunity to meet with them. And, you know, maybe a research position comes out of that, maybe it doesn't, but those kinds of connections are ultimately what will lay the, lay the groundwork for um, a successful kind of research experience. So you said at one time you were considering going to medical school. Yeah. Um, and during your time at Georgia Tech, you completed a co-op with St. Jude Medical. That's so what was, your, what was your main role at, at St. Jude while you were there? Um, so I was working on their design quality engineering team. Um, uh -huh. the, basically, design quality engineering is, is sort of responsible for ensuring the highest level of quality um, in the design process for new, new medical devices or kind of iterations on medical devices. So we worked very closely with kind of the R&D teams. Um, and my, and, you know, throughout this kind of uh, design process and approval process, there are the, 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 the kind of the design itself needs to be transferred amongst a lot of different hands. It needs to go to from R&D through to quality, through manufacturing, et cetera, before it can finally be kind of approved as something that's going to kind of go off and, and, and be created and commercialized. Um, and really what, I, what, we, what we found is that at St. Jude or at many medical device companies, that process of transferring the design um, was really sort of fragmented and, and people were really working in silos um, and there wasn't a lot of effective communication amongst various uh, departments. And so it was my role to kind of optimize and redesign that design transfer process, um, building kind of key technology tools to make, to really sort of optimize that, that, that line of communication and, and make sure that that design transfer happens in the best, most efficient way possible. I noticed you also earned your Six Sigma certification during that internship. Yeah, that's right. So, so I, how, yeah, how did that experience shape your studies or academic choices? It was it was really cool. It was very cool. Six Sigma is basically a, a methodology that um, focuses on finding ways to operate in a really kind of lean and agile um, way. Um, mm -hmm. For me, uh, it was you know, as, as, a, as an undergrad at the time, um, I was fairly new to kind of the, the, the operations and the working of, of a corporation or from sort of the, the industry and business world. Um, and so for me to kind of get exposure to how things kind of function in that landscape um, was, was really exciting. And I think that that's something that the, the Six Sigma course was, was really able to afford me. Um, I was also able to sort of leverage the project that I, that I was doing as an intern, as a co-op, um, as a part of that certification. Um, so I was able to sort of kind of leverage the learnings that I got through the Six Sigma yeah. certifications in the design of the, of the design transfer process. Um, so there was a lot of kind of iteration based on mm -hmm. what I was getting from the course. Great, great. So one last question about your internship. For students who are considering a co-op or an internship, what advice would you give them in terms of how to focus their search? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges 
that we we all face as students is that we, we kind of have this pressure of needing to get an internship or needing to get a co-op just to sort of you know pad the resume so that when we graduate we'll be able to get we'll be able to get a job um mm -hmm. and we, we don't really have we, we don't give ourselves the freedom to really ask ourselves like is this really is this internship really going to be benefiting me what am i really going to learn and gain from this internship um, and how much is this internship kind of setting me up for success to achieve kind of that longer term goal that I'm looking to achieve. Um, mm -hmm. I know sometimes it can be really challenging to do this, especially at a young age, but the sooner that you can kind of narrow in on a specific field or area or career goal or dream, um, the better you will be able to set yourself up for success. And so my advice would be to really kind of spend some time inwards um, and at least sort of figure out where, do, where you see yourself in the next five-ish years um, and, and find really ask thoughtful questions throughout the interview, interview process for these internships so that it's not just one way, that you're, you're also asking them back um, key questions to get a better understanding of what the scope of the role really is and how much the learnings you'll gain from that role will contribute to the, the goal that you're looking to or really where you're looking to take your career. Great. Yeah, I definitely think that's really important and awesome advice. Um, so shifting a little bit, um, following graduation, you relocated to Switzerland um, to take a position at Takeda as a digital engineer um, before moving again to Denmark to take on the integrated healthcare solution engineer role. Um, so tell us a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So it's kind of a, it was kind of a unique position. So that was sort of my first job out of college. Um, I initially started working for Takeda on their kind of um, did a team that was sort of like tasked with catalyzing the digital transformation across the organization. Um, so, you know, it's, it's actually you'll be baffled at how backwards a lot of large companies are, especially in the healthcare space. Um, and so wow. this was about five years ago, but. I mean, it was really basic, like some really basic things about just integrating technology and digital into the to the basic sort of business as usual ways of working was something that that um, that was key to Takeda's overall strategy. And so they created a whole team, a, a pretty small team called the Takeda Digital Accelerator um, that was we were all sort of reporting into the chief digital officer. It was a team of six people based globally um, in various locations. So, uh, you know, in, in Chicago was sort of their US headquarters at the time. Zurich was their European headquarters. We had people based in Singapore and then in Tokyo. Um, and we were sort of responsible for finding ways to integrate digital and technology into the way that um, both the commercials and R&D sides of the business operated. Um, Pretty quickly, this team sort of rapidly evolved into what it is today, which is more of a digital health incubation and venture investment team, um, where I, where, where we basically sort of invest in digital health companies, um, as well as incubate internally internal companies um, that either relate or, or only tangentially relate to core core business of Takeda. Um, so it was through this role that I actually founded Oshi Health, um, which was Takeda's first internally incubated ventures in the digestive health space. Wow, that's awesome. That's so awesome. Um, and so how were you able um, to apply concepts that you learned or other things that you learned throughout um, your into minor and taking into courses um, into these positions? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that having that really solid background in international affairs, especially within in Europe and, and, and the EU, um, was something that set me up for success um, as I relocated to, to Switzerland and then to Denmark. Um, getting an understanding for how these these, these countries sort of operate from a political standpoint, um, how they interact with one another. Also, the you know the opportunity of just sort of living in, in Europe for that summer um, gave me a sort of a, a feel for the lay of the land and an and understanding of various cultural differences that really benefited me in the business world. Um, so when I was living in Zurich, um, the, the, the Takeda offices there were extremely international um, in the sense that people from all over the world, but really all over Europe, um, were, were kind of living and breathing and working together in, in this one kind of location. Um, and so on a daily basis, I had to interact with people from, you know, 10, 15 different countries across Europe um, that all have a little bit of a unique kind of cultural mm -hmm. style, a little bit of a unique 
unique way of maybe even looking at the world, um, that having that sort of into background and that experience in the EU program um, really helped me kind of understand um, and, 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 and know a lot more deeply with a solid foundation um, than if I didn't have that experience before. That's awesome to hear that into um, and the European Union study abroad program have been so, so helpful um, for you during your career. Um, and so one more question on this. So what advice would you give to students who are considering um, pursuing a career internationally? Um, after I would I would say that keeping an open mind um is, is going to be the most important thing. I think that when you, when you, especially if you're planning to sort of work abroad, um, you'll find that a lot of the, the, the working styles and perspectives and cultures of different countries um, and, and people of different backgrounds may be conflicting or strange or um, not very clear from the get-go. Um, so I would say that when, you know, if a student were to sort of embark on, on an experience like that, um, that keeping an open mind and and finding be accommodating to other people's cultures mm -hmm. and, and sort of learning as quickly as possible what those nuances are um, is gonna is gonna set them up for success. So now you've recently started as the entrepreneur in residence at Morantix. So tell us about Morantix and, and what do you contribute in that role? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Morantix is an AI-based venture capital fund and venture studio. Um, that have um, a, a very a, a real kind of strong expertise in building um, artificial intelligence and machine learning products across a few key industries. Um, they've already launched four ventures um, in a few key industries, two in healthcare, um, mm -hmm. one in sort of the, the business intelligence space and one in kind of the self-driving cars automotive space. Um, I, I, I recently joined in the last month or two um, as an entrepreneur focused in healthcare, um, where I'll basically be spending the next six to 12 months coming up with new ideas, um, validating those ideas from a technical and commercial standpoint, doing proof of concept kind of programs until we feel confident that um, an idea is going to be worth investing in. Um, and then they will provide me with a few million euro in funding to sort of spin out and launch a new company in the healthcare technology space. Um, so now I'm, I'm really sort of spending a lot of time going deep into a few key areas within healthcare um, and um, starting to sort of partner with some key folks um, across the globe, really, to launch some proof of concepts in those areas. So will any of your work be based on what you've previously done with OSHI Health, or are you starting brand new ventures with new ideas? Starting brand new ventures. Starting brand new ventures. Okay. Yeah. And so you're working with teams of folks from around the globe, you said? Yeah, so it's a very international company. We're based in Berlin. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I would say, like, it, there's probably, of, it's, it's, at this point, it's about a 70-person team. Um, representing about 30 different nationalities. So a very international team um, working with some of the like top tier engineers um, and kind of product developers from around the globe um, to basically mm -hmm. create the next generation of AI based technology products. Okay. That sounds fascinating. Yeah. Sounds fascinating. Yeah. And so um, thinking about your experiences that you've had during your time at Georgia Tech and um, during your career afterwards, um, how has the coursework um, from the minor in international affairs offered a framework for what mm. you've been able it's a, to do? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think the coursework, some of the key coursework um, that, that I sort of recall deeply were around um, understanding how different uh, states or countries sort of interact with each other in the political kind of ecosphere. Um, and mm -hmm. those, those, that, the, those insights that I sort of gained from get, understanding kind of the history of the global kind of setting, as well as especially in Europe, um, and understanding how these various bodies kind of interact with each other, um, and, and sort of the theories behind um, why they do, why they kind of behave the way that they do. Um, really sort of opened my perspective to opportunities in uh, to basically work and scale companies in in various countries. I ultimately dream of having a, a, a healthcare technology company that has sort of a global reach. Um, having this deep understanding of 
international mm-hmm. affairs overall and how um, how how these sort of organizations operate is something that is 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 setting me up for success in that in that field. That's awesome. That's so awesome. Um, and so, what final advice or comments would you give to students who are thinking of pursuing a minor in international affairs or some of the other opportunities that you've had? I think um, that during your career, like I mentioned before, finding as soon as possible areas that you're 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 particularly interested in and passionate about, and finding ways to build a career around that are extremely extremely important. Um, I'm a huge advocate for entrepreneurship. I think it's like a, a great way to really make an impact on the world in an area that mm-hmm. you're especially passionate about. Um, so I would love to encourage students who are maybe interested in entrepreneurship or interested in really making an impact um, through through innovation to not not let themselves be sort of afraid of of kind of making that plunge. Um, getting a few years of experience in after after university, but also sort of really kind of keeping that as a North Star is something that I would highly advocate for. Um, and as you're sort of doing your coursework, finding kind of keeping your eyes open for problems and pain points that you see in the world in various areas that can potentially be solved through innovation. Um, I think those that would be something that I, if I could go back, I wish someone had told me in, at school to really keep my eyes peeled for things that could be done better. I think a lot of the times we sort of accept things the way that they are and we we, not, we don't really challenge them and try to dream kind of, of a new way of doing them. Um, I, would, I would sort of advise that people sort of, anytime you feel pain, anytime you notice that there is a pain point or a challenge, don't don't just accept that for for what it is. See if there's some way to solve it through innovation. Um, so that would be my my piece of advice. And I think that's a great great piece of advice to wrap yeah, up our awesome. conversation. I think it's been very um, enlightening to hear from you today and and see what the trajectory of your career has been. So we thank you for your time today, Sana. Thank you guys for having um, me. Certainly, we want to wish you the best in the future. We hope you're staying healthy, and we hope to hear more about your future success. That sounds great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. This podcast is produced by the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs at Georgia Tech. Developing policymakers for the 21st century. Music is Afternoon Nap by Ghost Rifter Official. Used under a Creative Commons attribution. Share Alike 3.0. Unported license.